What's up, guys? Welcome back to the MMA meeting. Let's talk with the Weasel Podcast, where we talk all things MMA. Hope you guys are having an amazing day, man. New History Podcast is going to be coming out on Wednesday, so be on the lookout for that. It's a very special one for me, one of my favorite figures in all of history when we're talking about combat and stuff. But we just had some fights last weekend. The UFC Fight Night card was not too great. I give a total score of like a 5 out of 10, 4 out of 10 for a fight night. It's kind of what I expected going into it. Even with the next up and coming fight night card, I'm not expecting too much. I'm just curious to see how Joe Pfeiffer is going to perform against someone like Jack Hermanson because Jack Hermanson is essentially like the gatekeeper of the elite middleweights. If you can get past Jack Hermanson, you're in, right? That's generally what happens. It happened with Jared Kananir when he beat Jack Hermanson. It happened with Sean Strickland when he beat Jack Hermanson. Marvin Vittori when he beat Jack. Roman Delizze is the only guy that beat Jack Hermanson in the last like five years or so who really wasn't on this caliber. But everybody else from Strickland to Vittori to Kananir, when they beat Jack, they were able to insert themselves at the top of middleweight, right? Essentially like the top five, right? Sean Strickland fought Alex Pereira right after that. And then Jared Kananir. After Kananir beat Hermanson, he fought Robert Whitaker in his next fight. Marvin Vittori fought Kevin Holland, who was not supposed to be the opponent. He was supposed to fight Darren Till at the time. But then after he beat Kevin Holland, he got a title shot against Israel Adesanya. So maybe Jack Hermanson's status as gatekeeper has regressed. Maybe he's not there anymore. It might be somebody else. But I think if Joe Pfeiffer beats Hermanson, he's going to insert himself to go up against some elite level middleweights. And there's other interesting fights like Brad Tavares versus Gregory Rodriguez is going to be pretty fun. Dan Ige versus Andre Feely is going to be a little bit interesting. I'm always interested to see how Michael Johnson performs. Much, much older outside of his prime now, but Darius Flower is going to give him an explosive fight, right? He's a guy who stands in front of you, goes blow for blow, has good in the clinch, has good elbows and knees, will engage Michael Johnson in the kind of fight that Michael Johnson wants, right? Adolfo Vieira versus Armin Pendrosian is a good fight. Trevin Giles versus Carlos Protes is an interesting one. Protes is uh, a talent that I'm looking forward to. And Max Griffin versus Jeremiah Wells is also a good fight too. The card in itself is not that great. It's like it's like the car with Delete and Imovov. And for this car, when we talk about the main event, so we know Nazardine won. And he clearly showed to be the better fighter. And is it more that Imovov showed how good he is? Or Delize showed that he's not on this level? I think it's a bit of both. I think Imovov had stellar moments. Like, there are moments where he looks like he could become the champion. He has that good of moments. But then other moments, it just makes you scratch your head like... Why is he punching himself into the clinch? Why is he walking himself in there to get tied up by Delize? And he can't get away from the clinch. It's so hard for him to get Delize off of him when he's pushed up against the fence. It seemed like half of that fight was against the fence. And it's both because Delize was not attempted to go for takedowns, even though he was down on the scorecards. He had to do something. Besides that one judge that gave it 47-47, that judge is out of his mind. He's on the same stuff that Sal Diamato's on. But Delize's not going for the takedowns. He's not even attempting to do anything really with it until like late in the fight where it was too late and Imovov on the other hand just didn't know how to get out of it he barely made an effort to get out of the clinch it looks like when he's at range Imovov is a very hard guy to handle sometimes especially at this point of his career where he's only getting better Imovov's progress has definitely shown he has good shot selection he has very good movement for a middleweight confident to exchange with someone like Delize by punching on the inside with those tight straights but then always walked in behind this punch which is going to collide himself with Delize that caused him to constantly get tied up and even there were moments where Imovov clinched up with Delize and then got reversed on the cage his range striking countering intercepting punches general timing and precision seems to be very good for a middleweight but in that fight it was hard for him to manage distance to keep Delize in that danger zone at all times right the mid range is where he was having a lot of that success even close range but when he collided with Delize is where all the problems were happening for Imovov even though he was cheated out of potentially two finishes one for sure with that grounded kick which he wasn't even grounded according to Nevada rules it's like to a point now where the ref doesn't even know what the rules are state by state they're different and everybody's confused by that right nobody knows when a fighter's down when they're not because every state has a different definition of it there's some states that say even having your fingers on the ground from one hand counts as a grounded fighter then there's other states where it says that you have to have weight bearing so you can't just touch the ground you have to put weight palm down on the ground which is what Nevada has but the lead say didn't do that and then there's other states where you have to have two palms on the ground. And maybe Herb Dean thought that Nevada is a state that you only need your fingers on the ground. It's so confusing. And imagine being a fighter and have to understand this stuff while going through a training camp and everything, right? The last thing you're thinking about, even though it is kind of weird to point this out, but for a lot of fighters, the last thing they're thinking about is the changing of rules from state to state, even though they should know it. Honestly, they should because it is part of the game. It's part of the sport. You have to know how to fight by the rules of the sport. 
right? Even how dumb the rules are, from the 12 to 6 elbows, to the down opponents, to the scoring system, everything, you have to know what it is, right, as a fighter. You have to know. It's the rules of the sport you participate in, so you have to know them. But Roman Delize was not down. He got kicked in the head, it was fair, and Imovov should have been able to finish him off from there. For a long time, this sport has turned on a path that's just so against strikers. And it's still interesting how the strikers are prevailing right now. Like most of the top fighters in the world right now are predominantly strikers. When you look at Alex Pereira as the light heavyweight champ, you had Adesanya and Strickland as the middleweight champs. Now we have Drake who could do a bit of everything. We have Leon Edwards in the welterweight division as champ. Islam is a good striker, but he's more predominantly a grappler, I would say. Volkanovski, predominantly a striker but could do everything at a pretty high level. Sean O'Malley, a striker. Alexa Grossel's more of a striker. Jean Wei Lee is more of a striker as well. It's interesting how the sport has been so against strikers just because of how the rule set is, but you have the best fighters in the world. Most of them are predominantly strikers. That's really interesting. It shows how much they had to adapt to the rule set. And if they change the rules where now wrestlers and grapplers can get soccer kicked and need on the ground, you're going to see a big fall off of grapplers. I think right away, you're going to see a big drop of the success from grapplers in the sport. And they're going to have to adjust and adapt to that. And then later on, let's say five years later, they're going to be the best fighters in the sport. And it would have been so different for the Delize and Imovov fight because Delize, he's much better on the ground than he is in the stand-up. He's not a technical striker at all. But it's actually so incredible how many good Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighters don't have good wrestling in the sport. When you would think it would be common sense, right, for a Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy with dangerous submissions to work on his wrestling to get his way to the ground so his Brazilian jiu-jitsu can work. He can barely work with his BJJ if he can't take the fight to the ground. So it's almost like you're hoping your opponent gets you down. These guys are so dangerous on the ground with their submissions, but they don't have a way to get it down there. It's like if I was a crazy good mechanic, but I don't know how to pop the hood of your car. How good are my ability to fix your engine then if I cannot get to your engine? You know, or maybe if you're like a crazy good shooter in football, but you just barely know how to dribble the ball at all. I don't know if there is a football player or a soccer player that is actually like that. I don't know. But I do expect that Imovov is going to get a much higher ranked opponent after that. For the co event, Hinato Moikano defeats Drew Dober in a very, very tough fight, right? This one was way harder from a Hinato Moikano than I thought it was going to be. He just doesn't do too well when fighters rush him down. They don't have to be even that technical doing it. He seems to get a bit overwhelmed. He does much better at distance with his jabs, his straights, countering you with those, his light kicks, his lead body kicks, all that stuff is actually pretty decent. You saw that in the Rafael Fazee fight. You you saw some of that in the Brad Riddell fight. He does have some good right hands on the back foot sometimes. He did show that in the Rafael Fazi fight as well, but he tends to get overwhelmed at times. Even if you just rush him, get in his face and throw bombs. Drew Dober is doing a little bit of that. Now, maybe that was, uh, maybe that has something to do with Hanato not fighting for over a year. You know, maybe he did have ring rust and he just didn't know how to handle that kind of pressure and power coming at him with that much ferocity. But that's what showed in this fight. And he needed to get the fight to the ground, which was pretty easy for him. Dober didn't really have much of a takedown defensive game outside of the lateral drop. Hinato Moikano will clinch up with him, walk him back, try to take him down. And then Dober used that momentum to throw Hinato Moikano over from the underhook and slam him on the ground. It worked one time and he tried it again in the third round. He didn't trip him out doing so. Hinato actually did a much better job of keeping his weight under him instead of forward. And he was able to just fall on top of Drew Dober. I don't even blame Dober for trying the lateral drop again because it worked before and he really didn't have many successful options. So he just banked on the one move that worked for him. And Drew was just locking Hinato down in the in the half guard. He didn't do too much to get out. And Dober was just trying to lock down the half guard for so much of that fight. And it goes both ways about the boring performance, right? Hinato's performance was not fun to watch, right? It was a lot of lay and pray, a lot of just sitting on top of him. But that's also Drew Dober's fault as well, right? He's on the bottom. He's trying to survive. He's in the place he does not want to be against a guy like Hinato. So he looked to just hold him into the half guard. But even still, there was a point in the fight where Hinato went into side control and then went back into half guard, knowing that Drew Dober is going to lock him down in that position. So also looked like Hinato wanted to be there as well because he was winning doing that. He was content with the fight playing out that way. And then he comes out with such a random and flaming pulse fight interview that made you forget about that performance. The guy is super fun on the mic. We just got to see some better performances out of him. You know, more fun performances to match that pulse fight interview. Because it's going to come to a point where the interview is not even going to matter anymore. People are just going to want to see him at least perform well, you know. And for Drew Dober, he might be another guy that they just need to give him strikers. Right? He might be that other Wonder Boy kind of fighter where, you know, let's just not match him with any more grapplers at this point. You know, it's not fun for the audience. He's probably not going to fight for the belt. He's probably not going to reach the top of this division. So let's just keep him around as some fun fighter to put on a show for the fans. And after this fight, Patty Pimblett 
seemed interested in fighting Hinato now, right? Hinato was saying that uh, Patty should fight Drew Dober. And then Patty's like, why would I fight Dober when I will smoke you too? And this is the fight that might happen. Hinato has probably the biggest name that Hinato can fight right now on his plate, right? Patty Pimplet is that guy. And we know Hinato wants money, right? So this is the kind of fight that's going to give him the eyes. He's not going to make as much money from this fight alone, but if he's able to beat Patty Pimplet, then he can negotiate for something better after. And honestly, for Patty Pimplet, it's a smart choice of an opponent for him too, since Hinato isn't too different from his style, right? Hinato's a guy who wants to go to the ground. He grapples a lot. He's definitely a better striker. Hinato is best on the ground though, and Patty will want that kind of fight against a higher skilled opponent. Out of everybody that Patty can fight around that skill level, Hinato is the guy he wants to fight. Because Patty Pimlet doesn't have great wrestling, he doesn't have a great ability to take the fight to the ground, and behind his chin and power, he could rush Hinato Moikano and have some success in the stand-up and find his way to the ground through some crazy chaotic scramble. But he's gonna get jabbed to the face constantly, he's gonna get kicked to the body, he's gonna get hit by right straights, and Patty's probably gonna gas out. He doesn't have great cardio either. I do expect Hinato to beat Patty, but it is the most doable fight for Patty at this point. He's in a position in his career where he has no more easy fights. There's no easy fights for him left. And I think almost everybody at that skill level will probably be him. Randy Brown, also on that card, had a great 1-1-2 against Muslim Salikov. It was some beautiful stuff, man. There's something about those punches that seem like they flow through the head of your opponent as if you didn't even hit them and they just fall. Those are some of the best knockouts, man. And that final angle he got on that straight, that was the kind of stuff you want to see out of Randy Brown. Natalia Silva is probably my favorite female fighter right now. She's good, man. Her footwork is on another level to these girls. She has a good shot selection. She's good with angles and is one of the few girls that can fight on the back foot. What about Kizriev coming back after two years without a fight and this one ends in 11 seconds due to an eye poke. That was supposed to be a really good fight too, man. What about Radke's boxing prevailing against Urbina who had no idea how to fight past those front kicks because of Radke's pressure. You saw Urbina panic throwing and left openings for Radke's left hook which eventually finished the fight. And then after in the press conference you see how Radke tells the journalist that they need to pay him for an interview so then no one asked him any more questions. I wonder if he did that on purpose though just to leave early. But maybe this could work for him in the future and it becomes like a meta for paid interviews. If Radke can get somewhere far in this sport and he just keeps this paid interview thing going, he becomes such a big deal, journalists will have to pay him in order to have those interviews. And then all the other fighters start doing it too. I know Patty Pimblett was trying to do that in the past. He did get a lot of flack for that though. Molly McCann just being way too strong and powerful for for Belbita. To call it as it is, Belbita's cool. She seems like a very nice person, but I just don't think she's UFC caliber, if we're going to be completely honest here. You know, there's a lot of fighters in the UFC that aren't on this level. Like, for an instance, Molly had a huge opening on herself for those body hooks while and after she was throwing the right hand, but Belbita just didn't have any power at all for that punch. She was hitting her to the body with those left hooks, but just couldn't drive it in. She didn't rip those body shots in there. And simple catches of her right hand and ripping her own hard left hook to the liver would give Molly so many problems in that fight. But Molly did get the fight to the ground. She got the arm bar and it looked like, I didn't keep up on the updates on this, but uh, it looked like she may have snapped Belbita's arm or at least it was a dislocation. Charles Johnson with a big upset showing how much records just don't really matter in the sport. He was 13-6 and six and his opponent, Maxim, was 17-0. and 0. Everyone thought Maxim was going to win this fight. What about Themba Garimbo finishing Rodriguez in like 30 seconds of that fight? He was throwing a lot of right straights from distance and then fading out away from those, right? Sometimes even moving out behind his own right shoulder to get away from his shorter opponent and then eventually just engage with the one overhand, right? So jab into the overhand. And Rodriguez is probably conditioned already by those right straights because a lot of right straights are thrown from Garimbo in those like 25 seconds. Great performance, man. He's probably going to get another house. But yeah, the card has some good moments, but wasn't the most exciting. And I think the next fight night card might be similar too. I'm not going to lie. And Ilya Tapuria is talking a very big game. And I'm not going to lie, man. I appreciate it, especially with the uh, contenders we got right now. There's not a lot of guys that's bringing the trash talk to the champion to the level that Ilya Tapuria is. No personal trash talk or anything, but just specifically skills. He's talking about not only beating Volkanovski, but beating him so badly, they're not even going to think about a rematch. He wants to absolutely bulldoze Volk. And Volk is getting into that competitive mindset as well. He's talking about how he doesn't want to just beat Tapuria. He wants to embarrass him. Man, both these guys got in each other's heads a little bit. Not to the point where like they're throwing each other off their game, but rising the stakes and bringing that competitiveness out of each other, right? When Tapuria is talking about this, when he's changing his Instagram bio, already saying that he's the featherweight champion, he's already calling shots of what's going to happen after he beats Volk. 
Is it confidence or is it cockiness? We're gonna find out. Will history repeat itself from the Aldo and McGregor fight? Because it's not too different. Ilya Teporia and Conor McGregor both ran through whoever was in front of them in the featherweight division. They were undefeated in the UFC. They started their mental warfare and went up against the dominant featherweight champion. Conor McGregor called his shots. Nobody believed that he was going to beat him the way he said he was, and he did exactly that. Not a lot of people are believing Ilya Tapuria either, right? We all understand that he can beat Volk, right? Nobody's disagreeing with that. But the way that Tapuria is saying he's going to beat Volk, that seems just as far-fetched as what Conor said about Jose Aldo. And if he goes out there and sleeps Volk, we might have a star on our hands because Ilya Tapuria is a very big deal over there in Spain. He's a big deal in Europe. If he knocks Volkanovski out and he has a good pulse fight interview, he might win over a lot of the American fans as well. And I can only imagine if they bring a fight afterward to Spain, having Ilya Tapuria headline that card, it would be enormous, man. And I'm just pumped for the press conference. I'm so excited about what these two guys are going to say about each other. I love to see that competitiveness come out of these fighters. They're going to say what they're going to do to each other. The face-off afterwards is going to be intense. Then we get the weigh-ins as well. The fans are going to be electrifying. The entrances to the cage and we will finally see can Volk break that curse the 35 year old curse right no champion under the welterweight division has ever successfully defended their belt at 35 years old and over and it's Volkanovski's first time up against the next generation fighter he's beaten the previous generation and Chad Mendez and Jose Aldo he's beaten his generation of Max Holloway Yair Rodriguez Brian Ortega etc and now he's going up against that next generation in Ilya Tapuria. And this is usually where the dominant champions run into a roadblock. Man, I'm so excited about this. They're going to be staring dead at each other. The ref is going to signal them to engage. And the collision between them two is going to be insane. I don't see a domination from one or the other. I don't see one of them running through the other guy, knocking them out early. I think blood is going to be drawn for both fighters. I think this is going to be a war and one of the best featherweight fights of all time. How will Volkanovski's jab keep Teporia at far range enough where he can leg kick him and try to find those left hooks around that, even off of his own Lee leg kick as well? Can Ilya Teporia bypass those long range attacks, get on the inside and start bombing on Volk? Will Teporia counter the leg kick, getting Volk to the ground and submitting him? Or can Volkanovski just defend the takedowns even after getting his leg kick caught and baiting Ilya Teporia into counter punches or sway him enough off of that jab in order to line up a right straight or a left hook is Ilya loves to bop and dip a lot and maybe Volkanovski can intercept some of the head movement. We also do know that both fighters don't do too well against head kicks, right? Both fighters don't. Volkanovski does not have good head kicking defense and neither does Ilya Tapuria. Both guys are around the same height as each other. Volk is more of a kicker than Ilya is. So maybe he brings up a head kick at Tapuria, intercepting some head movements, which is something we don't normally see from either fighter. So I'm curious to see if head kicks are going to come out. Can you imagine if Tapuria KO'd Volk with a head kick? I am so excited about this fight, and Ilya's talking that big game. He's going to exit that octagon, either a star and a legend, or as a meme on all the trash talk gone wrong compilations. If he gets dominated by Volkanovski, he's going to be on every single compilations of that. Also interesting is what Eugene Behrman shared about Volkanovski taking the Islam Makhachev fight on short notice. He said that he was against it. He said he didn't want Volk to fight Islam and he seemed to be not confident in Volkanovski winning that fight because Volkanovski could not beat Islam with a full training camp. How is he going to expect to beat Islam on short notice? That's what Eugene Behrman was saying. And he also said that Volk took the short notice fight to also sign a compensating new deal. He signed a new deal to fight Islam Makhachev and it's going to continue for his future fights as well. It's going to give him more money than ever before. Obviously, there's other reasons Volkanovski took the fight as well as he's mentioned many times already about, you know, his mental state and all that stuff. But money seemed to be another important factor. Islam was right when he said that Volk was taking this for the money. Not completely, but there was an aspect of that. And we can say, man, that if he waited it out like Drikas did, right? Drikas was supposed to fight Adesanya. He pulled out due to an injury. He wasn't ready. Drikas is smart enough to know, I'm not going to fight someone like Izzy compromised. I know how good that guy is. I'm not going to jump in there. Not in my best form. Volkanovski risked it. And there goes his lightweight title aspirations forever. And it can even cause a loss for his featherweight title too. And in Drikas' situation, he put his future in a better place. Because he did wait for it. Now he is the middleweight champion. And you can only imagine what if Volkanovski 
didn't make that decision to fight Islam on short notice because he did it. And there's no excuses about it. He made that decision himself. No one forced him to do it. He decided to do it himself. We did have some teasers though. We had some Leon Edwards and Israel Adesanya teasers. Leon says something about like a special fight is going to happen for him, making me think that it isn't going to be Bilal Muhammad. Maybe Leon is fighting Islam Akashev in June or July, or he's fighting Drikas Duplessis. We know that they were talking about Drikas fighting again, maybe. And I wonder if it's Leon stepping up, which I don't think is right because you got both Bilal Muhammad and Shavkat Rachmanov coming up behind him and Leon just defended his belt for the second time you know you got to defend your belt as I was saying like three or four times requirement that it should be a requirement for that and honestly I think he would have to beat both Bilal and Shavkat if those two don't fight each other in order to to move a different division, right? Move up to middleweight or have Islam come up to him or whatever it is. And Islam does the same thing in his weight class. Yeah, so that's going to be interesting of what Leon is going to do. And what if this special fight that Leon's talking about is actually Bilal again? Yeah, but I don't think he would make an announcement like that or a post like that on Instagram if he was fighting Bilal Muhammad. Unless he's talking about like he's going to main event UFC 300 with Bilal and that's the special fight because he's main eventing that card. Maybe that's what it is. And Israel Adesanya is also teasing his return with the 300 Spartan logo and he's posting some like wrestling training videos. So maybe we are getting Israel Adesanya versus Alex Pereira after all for UFC 300. Some people are thinking it's Hamzat versus Izzy. Izzy and Hamzat could not headline UFC 300, right? If that headlines UFC 300, I mean... It will sell a lot. It really will because both guys are stars. But a non-title fight that isn't Conor McGregor, Izzy's definitely a name in the sport, but he's not a Conor McGregor level. Like, I think you have to be Conor or maybe Habib or maybe Brock Lesnar in order to headline a car without a belt on the line. I think you have to be that level, at, at least to be considered for a main event. Adesanya draws like at most 800,000 with a right opponent. Maybe him and Hamza would draw 800,000 if they fought each other, even in a non-title fight. But I don't know, man. I don't know. That would be really weird if that's the main event. And if that's the case, if it's Izzy versus Hamza, you really only have one title fight on that UFC 300 card. You only have Zhang Wei, and it's Zhang Wei Li versus Yan Xiaonan. I mean, Geishi and Holloway is not a real title fight. Let's be for real here. It's That's not a real belt. Wei Li and Yan Xiaonan would be the only title fight on UFC 300. That would be so crazy. Even UFC 200 with all those canceled fights and pullouts had two title fights on it. Even though one of them was interim, right? They had Amanda Nunes and Misha Tate headline. And then they had Joel Zialda versus Frankie Edgar for the interim featherweight belt. And that card was supposed to have Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz at one point. Supposed to have John Jones versus DC to headline the card for the light heavyweight title. Like, this is different. Like, this is like their first option. Their first option is Izzy and Hamza. I'm probably thinking it's Pereira. If it's Izzy and Hamza, I would be somewhat disappointed. I will absolutely love the fight. I've been wanting to see Izzy versus Hamza for such a long time. But it feels weird as a fan of the sport to see that main event UFC 300. Without a title on the line. Izzy's coming off a loss. Hamza's coming off a controversial win over Usman. He's never fought for a belt before. And UFC 300 tickets go on sale next week. So I'm expecting the main event to be announced very soon. They have to announce the main event before the tickets go out. And then let's go right to the questions here. And we're going to start with Nano Peach. Hey Weasel, as always, love the content. What do you think if Dana announces the 165 pound weight class for UFC 300, Connor versus Chandler? Odds for that. And what do you think of Rebella's Dispain? Versus the top 15. The, the time Dana announces 165 is just for Connor and Chandler. Connor's attempted to become a triple champ. And then imagine he beats Chandler. Man, people would leave that fight saying Connor's the greatest fighter of all time because he's the only triple champ of the sport. The only triple champ of the sport. No one's ever done it. And he never lost any of his belts. He never lost the 145 belt, the 155 belt. And he's going to retire with the 165 belt. Goat status, Conor McGregor, greatest of all time. No one's ever done it. Dude, can you imagine? I could just imagine the narrative coming out of that fight. But the odds on that, I don't think it would happen. <laughs> Conor retires and then the 165 pound weight class retires with him. He will also have the only 165 pound win in UFC history. And then for Rebellas Despain, honestly, right now, he could probably be top 10. There's so many of those guys. I think he could just one shot, even in the, the top 15. He's so much faster than most of those guys. He's bigger than most of them. He's way better of a striker than most of them, even though we haven't seen much of it. As much as we saw from Rebellas Despain, he's already a better striker than like 70% of that weight class. He might be too long for Marcos Rogero de Lima, but it could go either way. I think he beats Nascimento. I think he one-shots him. I think he one-shots Romanov. It depends which Alexander Romanov comes out there. If it's Giga Chad Alexander Romanov, I think he might beat Despain. If it's Jab of the Hut, Alexander Romanov. I think Despain one shots him. Jarzino Rosenstrike. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised one way or the other. Uh, I think they could probably both beat each other. Martin Tibora. I think Tibora could try to get fight to the ground, but he might get knocked out by a jab. Despain should beat Derek Lewis. 
honestly speaking, unless Lewis wrestles him. But even then, the spin is so much faster. He has such a long reach. He'll keep Lewis at the end of his punch all day. I mean, he literally has like a nine inch reach advantage on Derek Lewis. And he's like four inches taller. And Derek Lewis does not move. I can honestly see Despain knocking him out from distance like that. Sergey Spivak, if he gets his hands on uh, Despain, he might get the fight to the ground and submit him. But he also has no footwork. He barely moves. He's so incredibly slow. It might honestly go down similar to what Cyril Gaon did to Spivak. And also, Despain is huge, right? At least he has some physical strength to work with here if he does get into the clinch. Tied to Ivasa. tuvasa has got some stuff. You know, he's got some light kicks. He can charge his way on the inside and try to knock out Despain, which I can see working for Tuivasa. But I can see Tuivasa getting knocked out himself too. He is so defenseless at times. And he's so short too, man. He would have like a 13-inch reach disadvantage. Jelton Almeida would beat him. Takes him to the ground, submits him. Alexander Volkov probably beats him. I think Volkov's a better striker right now. He also has the height to work with. He's not going to be outsized by Despain. He can try to trip him out in the clinch too. I'm just really wondering what Despain's progress is going to look like. Curtis Blades beats him. Stipe beats him. For sure, but Stipe is not looking too great. Stipe will probably take him to the ground and just beat him up. Sergey Pavlovich, I think Sergey beats him. I think Cyril Gon beats him too. I think he's way faster. He's so slick on the feet compared to Despain. Tom Aspinall and John Jones dominate him. They're with a, a better grappler. Hey, Weasel, how many top 10 heavyweights do you think Gable Stevenson could beat with a year of MMA training? Love your work. Just got to fill in those wrestling gaps in your commentary. Gable Stevenson is young enough where he can make that transition. He's like 23 years old. He's just winning all over the place. I mean, he's a heavy guy, but he's quite short. The thing that we have to differentiate is amateur wrestling from MMA wrestling. It's very different. And imagining the progress of Gable Stevenson, even with like a year of training, it's quite hard to pinpoint. But I would say looking at the rankings, I think with a year of training, he can get probably into the top 10. Let's say his wrestling transitions well. I think he's easily the best wrestler there, right? The only guy that might be able to contest his wrestling somewhat because of how different it is with MMA is probably John Jones, All right? Curtis Blades could put up a bit of a fight, but I think he will out-wrestle Curtis Blades. He's actually very nimble for his weight, and I recommend a lot of people look at the Tokyo Olympics that happened a few years ago. The guy's very fast. It's just how much of his ability to finish opponents with that wrestling, whatever he learns in MMA is completely unknown. Maybe he develops a really good striking game. Maybe he becomes like another Daniel Cormier. Maybe he's able to develop a very good submission game. Maybe his ground opponent is like Fedor's, you know? It's really hard to know what else he could do besides wrestling because we know he will be able to take down most of these guys. We know that he will be able to outmaneuver most of these guys on the ground. They're not going to be able to transition with him that well. And there's not like a lot of good jiu-jitsu guys either in this weight class. There's Tom Aspinall, John Jones, Jalton Almeida. Spivak has some good submission grappling. You know, there's not a lot of guys here that can outgrapple him or, or at least possess some kind of submission threat to him. Even Cyril Gaon with some of the submissions he has, he's not going to pose too much of an issue against Gable Stevenson, I think. So I think with a year of training, he's top 10 caliber. Longer training, let's say five years, I wouldn't be surprised if he would make his way into the top five. But I don't know if he will ever go to MMA because I do think he's signed with the WWE. Then we go to the next question, Richard Connolly. Hey, Weasel, your uploads are something I always look forward to. Thank you so much, man. Number one, if Volk lose to Ilya, and it's sort of clear, and that's not even because of Ilya's skill, but it's because Volk can't withstand Ilya's shots and he just crumbles in the first round due to strikes he should be able to take. This is a hypothetical. This definitely should not be what happens. But where do you think in that scenario, Volk goes from there? If that happens, do you think most people say that he'd be a washed Volk? And would you agree? So yes, I think most people would say if Ilya knocks out Volkanovsky in the first round, a big narrative coming out of that from Joe Rogan to fans to some of the commentators, etc. are going to say that, you know, Volk should not have taken that Islam fight. He is 35 years old. When you're 35, it's hard to stay in your prime. He got knocked out a few months ago. You know, there there is validity to all of that. So part of a lot of Ilya fans right now want to see him actually dominate Volk and not necessarily just knock him out because... If he dominates Volk for five rounds or, you know, he beats him by a decision and Volk looks good, it gives Volk an opportunity to look good out there and Ilya still beats him, then there's not going to be as much of an excuse as to why Volk lost to Ilya. But if he comes out there and knocks him out like he is actually intending to do, he thinks that he's going to walk right through Volk. I think a lot of people are going to say that he beat a wash Volk. And would I say that? I would need to see Volk's next fight, right? I wouldn't know for sure because those are valid claims, right? Those are valid arguments. So I would have to see how Volk performs in his next fight in order to really know if he's washed or not. And even in the fight, if he is able to show some good stuff and he just gets caught by something, I would be able to tell if he's washed at that point. Just off of the hypothetical thinking about it, it's impossible to know. You have to see how Volk looks first. And then number two is Colby overrated and was a sentiment, quote, if Usman doesn't exist, Colby is the champ, end quote after UFC 268 false in retrospective. Considering the fact that Colby beat Lawler coming off of two losses, and then Tyron 
also coming off two losses, to get his title shots. Also, was this view of Colby as the gatekeeper of this division at the time wrong? And when you say gatekeeper, you mean like gatekeeper to the title shot or something? That's valid to say too, because those are true. Most of the guys that he beat were older. None of them are around anymore. A few of those guys are coming off losses. You can say all those guys were not in their prime. Lawler was not in his prime. Tyron was not in his prime, RDA was not in his prime, and even Damian Maya, you could say, was not in his prime. The whole thing about Colby Covington being the next best fighter after Usman was just off the fact of how well he performed against Usman, right? They looked like they were nearly even. And it might have been more because of the styles of the two, that they clashed very well together, and they're always going to have very close fights. I do think Colby was good. I don't I don't agree with the overrated stuff or the sentiment that Colby was just not good. I think Colby was really good, and nobody's able to fight Usman like that without being a good fighter. Nobody is, right? You have to be at a high skill level in order to compete with Usman like that, no matter who you are. And Colby did that twice. He was winning the first fight until he got finished in the fifth. And the second fight was a controversial decision, which a lot of people, and as do I, believe it was a draw. To perform that well against Kamar Usman, you have to be a good fighter. And honestly, at the time, there weren't a lot of guys you would put above Colby. Leon was still coming up, and he was very inactive at the time, so it was really hard to rank Leon Edwards. Jorge Masvidal, he was not on Colby's level, and he was like the next best guy after that. So it's like, you know, maybe Hamza Shemaev when he bursted onto the scene, but that was like before he fought Gilbert Burns to prove himself. Gilbert was the other guy. Gilbert, I think, was a very bad stylistic matchup for Colby Covington, and he's also a guy on that skill level. It's just he loses the Usman worse than Colby does. So it was also the state of the welterweight division at the time, because who else do you look at? Stephen Thompson? Stephen Thompson would get ragdolled by a prime Colby Covington. And I love Stephen Thompson, but it's just the truth. Then we go to Mike. Hey, Weasel, always love your videos. Thank you so much, man. Number one, if Volk had lost to Islam at UFC 284, the same way he lost the second fight by first round head kick, In that exact fashion, would you see any changes occurring in the timeline after UFC 284? Would Islam have fought earlier than October? Would Volk still have fought Yair? And most importantly, would Volk be as loved and appreciated as he is or much less? So in the first fight, if Islam had kicked Volk in the first round and KO'd him, no, I think he still would have fought in October because they want him for Abu Dhabi. Um, I don't think he has much of a choice. I mean, maybe he would have another fight because he would not have gone damaged in this scenario. So perhaps he would have fought in the summer. Maybe fought Charles Oliveira there. Charles does not get injured, right? He doesn't get the cut. Maybe we see the rematch between them two. Then for this scenario, let's say he beats Charles. He goes into October and he fights Justin Gaethje. Honestly, the order of the lightweight division would probably have moved much faster at this point, and Islam would have a much better claim to go up to welterweight if he beat Charles and Gaethje after he head kicks Volkanovski. I think by this time, maybe March, February, or June, we see the Leon fight with Islam Makhachev, and I think we would know that guaranteed for sure. Now, on Volkanovski's side, I think, yes, he still would have fought Yair, and I do not think Volk would be as appreciated as he is right now, because... A lot of the appreciation from Volkanovski comes off of his performance against Islam Makhachev. It was his biggest fight of his entire career. He fought a close fight with the pound-for-pound best fighter in the world right now at a higher weight class than his own. Everybody loved Volk for that, appreciated his skill set so much that he was still deemed the number one pound-for-pound fighter in the world even after the first fight. But if we just saw him get head-kicked and KO'd easily by Islam like that, I think it's pretty objective to say that Volk would not be as appreciated as he is. Then your second question, if John Jones beats Tom Aspinall easily, how bad would that make the heavyweight division look? Do you think it would be the final nail in the coffin for the heavyweight division? Yeah. If John Jones runs through Tom Aspinall, this division will be dead in the water for like the next five years. It's not because John Jones is bad. That's not the reason. It's because Jones would beat Aspinall easily, the other best heavyweight, and then retire. And the issue with this is that Tom Aspinall is young for the heavyweight division. He's going to be the champion after John Jones and carry on that title reign forever as long as he reigns on top of this weight class. And whoever else, if it's Sergey Pavlovich beating him or if it's Jelton Almeida, whatever, nobody's going to give any of these guys credit because John Jones was the guy. He beat that next generation in dominant fashion. John Jones is just that good, right? That would be another narrative coming out of that. The only other guy that people will still be thinking about is Francis. Nobody else. Everybody will bundle in Tom Aspinall, Sergey Pavlovich, Jelton Almeida, Curtis Blades. The people just bundle these guys together as all, you know, Jones would just wash all of them. Who cares about these heavyweights? Look what Jones just did to Aspinall, who is supposed to be the best of these guys. I think the UFC would actually have to hope for Rebellas de Spain to run through the whole weight class. If Rebellas de Spain runs through the weight class after John Jones retires, that would be their hope for the next big star of the heavyweight division. Then your third question, 
Ilya Taporia versus the lightweight top 10. How hard is the matchup for the winner? I don't like Ilya at lightweight. He is way too small. I think he beats Dan Hooker, mainly because of the grappling difference. Looking at knockout Hooker is not a good game plan, unless you're Michael Chandler, and Michael Chandler's built like a tank. I think Jalen Turner beats him. I mean, look at what Jai Herbert did to him, right? If Jai Herbert's catching you like that, I can only imagine what Jalen Turner would do. Jalen Turner is also very, very fast. He's also like around the same height and reach as Jai Herbert too, but just being a way better striker. Rafael Vaziv, I got Vaziv. Defend the takedown, especially in the three-round fight. Defend the takedowns and I'll strike him mostly. In a five-rounder against Vaziv, I can see Tapuria outlasting him and probably finishing him in the later rounds. But Neil Dariush, I would pick Tapuria. Matush Gamrot, I'd probably pick Tapuria, but that's a very tough fight. Gamrot is much bigger than him, and I think the size is going to allow him to hold down Tapuria a bit. On the feet, though, Gamrot doesn't have too much for Tapuria. But I might lean to Tapuria there. I got Michael Chandler. I got Armin Saryukian, I got Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, I got Charles, and I got Islam Makashev. Charles' risky style can allow Tapuria to catch him, but I think more likely Charles would win. Then with the Mike Griffith, I watch your video and admire your abilities to break down fights. A lot of things you say I hear even Joe Rogan say too, which lets me know you know what you're talking about. But there's one fight you calling that I have to disagree. The Gaethje vs. Max Holloway fight. You seem pretty sure that Gaethje is going to win. Even Tony Ferguson gave Gaethje a little run for his money on the feet, and Ferguson is not even half the boxer that Max is. And it's not like Gaethje has this great ground game either. Call me crazy, but I'm calling it now. This will be easy money for Max Holloway, easy. You guys say Max gets hit a lot. Yeah, but so does Gaethje. In fact, I'm pretty sure Gaethje gets hit more in his fights than Max does. I'm no expert such as you or Rogan, but based on what I've seen, all Max has to do is avoid the leg kicks and he'll be fine. Please educate me if I'm wrong on this. Okay, so your first question. Thank you so much. Now just to correct the last thing about Gaethje getting hit more. Not only does Max get hit more than Gaethje, he is statistically the most hit fighter in UFC history. But he also hits fighters more than anybody else. So he's on the extreme ends of offense and defense. So no, Geishi does not get hit more than Max Holloway, especially these days. And I am turning around a bit more on the Geishi destroying Max Holloway thing. I don't think this is going to be an easy fight for Justin Geishi. I think it's going to be a war, but I do think that Max is going to get hurt in this fight and could even get finished in this. But I also do think that Geishi is going to get hit a lot as well. Max is going to be working the body. He's going to be landing some good shots over the top, conditioning for those body head trades. But the leg kicks from Geishi, the intercepting uppercuts and overhands, the jab is going to be so disruptive. And every time they exchange with each other, it's going to be very scary for Max Holloway, man. And the comparisons with Tony Ferguson... Yeah, Tony did give Geishi a, a bit of a run for his money, but that was before Geishi adjusted after the second round, right? He got a little bit wild into the into the brawl with Tony Ferguson, and he got caught for that. And if he continued to do so, he would still get caught for it, right? He would continue to get caught by Tony Ferguson. But there's a big difference you have to look between Max Holloway and Tony. Tony's bigger than Max. The guy's a real lightweight, and he used to be a welterweight at one point. He also has an incredible reach and very athletic in his prime. He's not the boxer that Max is. He's not as technical as Max is, right? He doesn't kick or throw punches the same way. He doesn't create the angles that Max does off of his short combinations. Max is a way more technical striker than Tony Ferguson, but Tony has other things that Max just does not possess, like the reach, like the power, the awkwardness, and all that stuff. Max is a lot more textbook with what he throws out there than Tony is, right? Tony's not textbook at all, which makes it very difficult to understand what he's doing out there, but Geishi was able to get that down after the second round. With Max, is going to be a little bit of a different fight. Max is a lot more of a uniform style. Max is more of what Geishi sees than what Tony is, right? right? But I don't think this fight is going to be easy one way or the other. I think Geishi is going to win. I think both guys are going to get hurt in this fight, but I can see Geishi causing the more damage of the two and maybe even finishing Max Holloway out there. No one Max has ever fought hits like Justin Geishi. Not even close. Jose Aldo doesn't. Volkanovski doesn't. Brian Ortega doesn't. Korean Zombie doesn't. None of these guys reaches the power of Justin Geishi. None of them. Even Dustin Poirier doesn't. Dustin does not knock people out like the way Geishi does. Geishi has some of the most power ever in that lightweight division, right? When you think of the hardest punchers in lightweight history, you think of Justin Geishi toward the top, and Max is going up against that monster. And then with the JG, if fighters couldn't have coaches in their corners or anyone else to give them advice, only Cutman and Waterboys there, who would be the champ of each division? Heavyweight John Jones, I don't think he needed a coach to beat Surreal Gone. I think Alex Pereira would still be the light heavyweight champion. I think Strickland would have beaten Drickus because adjustments from Drickus Duplessis is a big thing for him. And I think without his coaches, it'll be harder for him to make adjustments. He'll still make them, but not 
as well as he does. You could say that Strickland may have needed a coach against Adesanya, but with how dominant that was, even from the beginning of that fight, right, the first round, I don't think he needed the coach more than Adesanya did. I think Adesanya needed a coach more after that first round. And even Strickland said after the fight, like, he thought he was fighting an amateur. Everything Adesanya was doing, it was just obvious. Everything was clear to see. For the welterweight division, Kamar Usman will still be the champ, obviously. Right, we all know Leon Edwards greatly benefited from his coach. In the lightweight division, I think Islam Makhachev would still be the champ. In the featherweight division, clearly Volkanovski, right, clearly. I think maybe the max fight would have been closer, the third one, but I still think Volkanovski will be the champ right now. For the bantamweight division, it would either be Piotr Jan or Sean O'Malley. And the reason why I say Piotr Jan is because if you remember when he threw the knee in Aljamain, he looked at his coaches and his coaches told him to knee him. So if he did not have his coaches, he would not have need Aljamain, most likely. And he would have won that fight. O'Malley did beat Jan later in a three-round fight. Who knows how a five-round fight would have went. I'd probably think Pietrion would have stayed champ. Maybe Marab Davalashvili would have been the guy to beat him, though. So maybe Marab right now would be champ. So it could be Marab, it could be O'Malley or Pietrion. It's hard to really say. And then the flyweight division, I think Pantoja. For the women's bantamweight division, I guess Pennington still. For flyweight, I would still pick Grasso. I don't think that um, spinning kick opening was really from the coaches. I mean, they did say they drilled that in training. So it was always on Alexa Grasso's mind, always. Like, she didn't need her coaches in the corner in order to know how to counter that. So yeah, I would say Alexa Grasso will still be the champ. And then for the flyweight division, Jean Wei easily will still be champ. Then we'll go to Thicolo. Is it gay to fall in love with another man and spend the rest of your life with them? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what gay is, right? And if a man falls in love with another man, not just has love for them, yeah, then that would make him gay. Then we go to the worst box. I have two questions. Do you think it's generally pointless for the PFL to try and compete with the UFC? They're not pulling any viewers away, and some of their stars keep leaving for the UFC, such as Kayla Harrison. Do you think they should change something to be more unique and gain viewers? I'd like to hear your thoughts. Second question, what are your most underrated parts of each UFC champion that nobody talks about enough? So with the PFL competing with the UFC... They're all going to do that no matter what field you're in. When you're the biggest in any field, there's going to be the smaller guys that are going to try to compete with that because it ties your name to them. And that gets the UFC fans that don't know anything about the PFL to get recognized with that name. Oh, I've heard the PFL before. Yeah, I've heard about that Kayla Harrison girl. She went to the UFC. She came from that organization PFL, right? Francis Agano just went to the PFL, right? They're starting to hear about that organization, but I don't think they'll ever grow bigger than the UFC will. And whether they compete with the UFC or not, their stars, if they want to go to the top brand, the top organization in the world, they're going to go there. Them competing with the UFC is not really going to cause Kayla Harrison to stay there, right? Kayla wants to fight against the best fighters in the world, and most of those girls are in the UFC, so that's where she wants to go. And she could potentially become a star. She also knows that the 135 division is so shallow, she might easily become champ and rule for like five years. And doing so would make her more money than she made in the PFL. So it's a clear business move for Kayla Harrison as well as competitive. Now, in terms of being unique and gain viewers and stuff, it's very hard, man. You got to gravitate towards probably a different audience because the audience knows the UFC. Like the casual fans, they don't, they don't care about any other organization at this point. Like with Pride, for an example, we look at the only other organization that competed with the UFC. And even at one point, you can argue was bigger than the UFC. Pride had a different audience that they were garnering to. They were in Japan, right? They had a whole Asian market to work with that the UFC was not even at, right? The UFC was barely even there. I don't even know if the UFC ever was in Asia when Pride was around. So they had that as well as like the best heavyweights on the planet that came from kickboxing. You had Mirko Krokop coming in there. You had this guy, Fedor Emelianenko, Vanderlei Silva from Brazil, who fought in the UFC before. And they were so big that even the UFC sent Chuck Liddell over there to compete to prove that their guys were better than Pride. And that didn't go too well. He beat Alistair Overeem, but then he got destroyed by Quentin Jackson. And it's funny because Quentin Jackson came to the UFC and became the light heavyweight champ. You also did have Quentin Jackson, Kevin Randleman, Mark Coleman, who a lot of people knew at the time, went to Pride. He was the UFC heavyweight champ, the first ever. And they also put on like spectacles. They put on some freak show fights like Fedor versus Hung Men Joy. And those fights were so popular, man. Those fights were so famous. They were all over the internet. Do you know how many fans became a fan of this sport because they watched a highlight of Mirko Krokop and Fedor? And the difference with the PFL is... They're focusing on the same exact audience that the UFC is. And those fans are locked in with the UFC. Like, they're not going to go anywhere else. The only place they might go to is, like, one. To look at some stuff over there. Because it's a different market. And they do Muay Thai fights. It feels like a different thing. You know, it's not exactly what the UFC is. PFL is looking like what Bellator was. Second-rate UFC. That's kind of what it's looking like. 
Strike Force was kind of similar too. Strike Force was big, but it wasn't bigger than the UFC either because they were working with the same audience. They had Nick Diaz and Fedor came over there. Fabrizio Verdum was over there. Dan Henderson was there. So you had some stars, but even still, that didn't work for them. And the UFC eventually absorbed them into their organization, make them even bigger. They did the same thing with WEC, which created the lower weight classes. It's going to be very hard for the PFL to compete with the UFC. And I don't think they should try. I think they should try to do their own thing instead. And I don't know what that is. Honestly, I don't know what they can do over there. Make it freak show fights. That's like the only thing I can think of at this point. And then for your second question, what are the most underrated parts of each UFC champion that nobody talks about enough? John Jones may have one of the best chins in UFC history. Dude, that sheer front kick that he took from Brandon Vera would have knocked out so many people. And he just ate it. He ate two of them. Two of them. Two, to the face. And he was grounded. And then he punished Brandon Vera for that. For Alex Pereira, he has some of the best feints out of any of the big guys, right? When you look at middleweight and up, he has some of the best feints out there, right? Most people just talk about the power. They talk about the leg kicks. They talk about the left hook. and But his feinting game is actually very, very good for his weight class. He tricks you so easily. And he did it against Sean Strickland, and it worked. For Adricus Duplessis, it's something I've mentioned a lot. I don't know how underrated it is, though. He's better tactically than he is technically. He's better by game plans and adjustments and tactics in a fight than he is being a technical fighter. And he's showing how you can win off of being smarter without even having the necessary technique that looks clean and crisp and stuff like that. Even though his grappling sometimes looks pretty good, his striking is missing so much of that. Leon Edwards, one of the best kickers in the UFC right now. And it's not just because of the head kick on Usman. Islam Makashev, I don't know how many people want to believe this, but he's one of the most effective strikers in the UFC and and one of the highest fight IQs maybe of all time. Alexander Volkanovsky, I don't think there's anything underrated. I mean, I guess I would say one of the best leg kickers of all time. And it's not because of the power. It's more about the technique and how he uses them, right? He doesn't use them to destroy your leg. He uses them to set up his own boxing, his other kicks, his takedowns, his movements, his ability to cut you off, his angles are all work off of these leg kicks, man. And he manages his distance so well off of them. Sean O'Malley, one of the best strikers in the UFC and some of the best footwork you're going to see in this sport. Alejandre Pantoja, probably is going to reign longer than any other champion right now. Raquel Pennington, oh man, uh, she's very aware even understanding of when she should have uh, stopped the fight with Nunes, how to survive against Silva on the ground. like She's very aware in a fight. Alexa Grasso. She works off the jab better than most female fighters and has a really good lead orthodox body and head kick. And then Zhang Wei Li. She's even better than you think. I don't know what else is underrated. She's so good, man. Then we get to Mombaroi. How do you think Ilya Tapuria does against the top five featherweights and lightweights, including Vulcan Islam? So I already covered the lightweight division. Let's just go to the featherweight division. Top five at featherweight, including Volkanovski. So number five, Mavsar Evlov. I think Ilya Tapuria is a very bad stylistic matchup for Mavsar. Brian Ortega, I got Ilya Tapuria. There's only so much damage Ortega could take from someone like Tapuria. Yair Rodriguez is scary because of the head kicks, but I think Tapuria will get in close. Yair doesn't have the best weapon to keep you away from him. He kind of just tries to intercept you with something big. And I think Tapuria would be able to get in the inside. He will be able to land some big punches, take him to the ground, and submit or ground and pound Yair to a finish. Max Holloway. This one's interesting. I think I'm leaning toward Max Holloway. I think in the stand-up, he can intercept a lot of Tapuria's movements because of that output. Tapuria likes to lean all over the place and... Holloway can intercept that with a bunch of techniques at different angles and from different stances. The only thing that worries me about Holloway is getting taken to the ground and submitted. Holloway doesn't fight a lot of guys that have good wrestling and good jiu-jitsu. And he's been taken down quite a bit, even by guys like Yair Rodriguez, which is not a good look. And I think Tapuria could get him to the ground, and he is so dangerous on top. I'm going to go with Max, but that is a very dangerous fight for him. And then Volkanovski, I'm going to go with Volk. I think the jabs and the leg kicks are going to be a big thing for Volk in that fight. They go to Aguila Elizabeth. Hey, Weasel, two questions for you. Number one, after seeing UFC 297, I'm convinced that Sean Strickland has the most loyal fans in the UFC and has the ability to win over almost any crowd. Do you think that he has the potential to be one of, if not, the biggest star? And then you have a second question after. So yeah, Sean Strickland has very loyal fans. There's a lot of people that are his fans, you know. It's because he's like... He represents the common man. He really does. Like, there's a lot of people, a lot of fighters that try to take that angle with their character, but they never seem like the common man. Sean Strickland is finally the guy who reached the top that really reminds you that he's one of the fans. Like, he's one of us. He's one of the normal guys kind of thing. Obviously, he's not normal. You know, he's he went through a very difficult life, but those struggles are what a lot of people relate to him with. And the things that he says in the media. The fans are so sick. Not just in MMA. But just across all media. The fans are so sick of fakeness. And finally there's someone who comes forward with some realness. At this point in society. If you just speak some real stuff. 
People are going to respect you for it. When in the past, I was always just a default. Now, because of how fake everything is, you have a guy like Sean Strickland come forward and just say the stuff that a lot of fans just appreciate. Even the fans that don't agree with what Strickland says, they do appreciate or respect his approach to all of this. It's almost like he's fighting against the mainstream media and he was a champion. There's a lot of guys who just never wanted to take that angle. It was too risky for them. So you didn't see any champion do the stuff that Strickland does and say the stuff that Strickland says. And because of who he is, he's going to have these fans fans forever. Strickland could lose his next fight and his fans are still going to love him. It reminds me kind of like one of the Diaz brothers, right? The Diaz brothers has something similar too. They weren't as political as Strickland is, but they had realness to them too. That's why people love the Diaz brothers. They always have, and they don't have great records either. They've lost so many times, especially Nate, but the fans will love them forever. Yes, the way they fight, they go through wars in the cage, but people also love to just hear them on the mic because you're expected to hear some real stuff out of these guys. They're not cookie cutter fighters. They're not cookie cutter champions. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But in today's society, a lot of people are going to appreciate someone like the Diaz brothers or someone like Sean Strickland. And those are the kind of fighters that the fans are going to relate to the most. Regarding all of this though, I do not think he will become the biggest star in the UFC. I don't think there's anybody that's going to become as big as Conor McGregor, at least not anytime soon. People seem to really forget how big Conor is. Conor was not just a star in the UFC. He transcended sports. Do you know what it means to sell out over a million pay-per-view buys consistently? That is such an extraordinary feat. To do it even once is crazy. To get 700,000 is big. But over a million multiple times consistently like he does, that's insane. I don't think there is any fighter on the roster that's even close to Conor McGregor's star power. Not even John Jones. And Jones is the next biggest star. And he's not even close to Conor. And look how much of a big deal John Jones is. Sports fans just know who John Jones is. That's how big of a deal he is. And he's not even close to Conor. And then your second question, if you can combine the skill sets of any two fighters from all time to make one fighter, who would you choose and how long do you think they could be champ for? Two skill sets. Volkanovski and Islam. Easy. No one beats them. That is literally the perfect fighter. How long would they be champion for? I don't think they would lose. 30 and 0, 40 and 0, 50 and 0, whatever. Even Father Time would have a hard time with that fighter. They would go to Intent Chief. We often see fighters lose multiple rounds and then be told then, need a finish only to still lose. Which fighters have consistently lost multiple rounds and came back to win a decision or get a finish? Keep up the good work with the channel. Thank you so much, man. Yoel Romero is a clear example of this. There's been so many fights where he's losing rounds and he just gets a knockout in the third, which he's actually done multiple times. He was losing to Derek Brunson, knocked him out. He lost a round to Chris Weidman, knocked him out. He lost the first round to Luke Rockhold, knocked him out in the third. He lost the third round to Jacques Ray Souza, but won a decision. Very close split decision, though. The first round of Lyoto, I thought, was pretty close. He might have lost that one. I just don't remember the scorecards. But then he knocked him out in the third round. Tim Kennedy. He almost got knocked out at the end of the second and then knocked him out in the third. Yoel Romero is very consistent with losing at least one round in every fight and then finding a knockout in the third round. Another fighter would be like Derek Lewis, right? Derek Lewis loses so many rounds and then finds some crazy right hand and knocks his opponent out. It always seems like he's losing the majority of his fights before he finishes them. The Alexander Volkov performance was crazy. I mean, he was getting pieced up. Even Curtis Blades was piecing him up a bit and then he just knocks them out. You could say Robbie Lawler, you know, with his second fight with Roy McDonald, he was down on the scorecard. He only won the second round. He finishes Rory in the fifth. He lost rounds against Carl's Condit and won. He lost rounds against Matt Brown and won. Johnny Hendricks, of course. You could look at Cheeto, right? Cheeto's career is full of stuff like that as well. Then we go to Gobson F1. What historic warrior would you think would have the best chance of winning a UFC championship in present day? And who can that warrior beat from the top 15 pound for pound? Love the content. Keep it up. Thank you so much, man. None of them. Martial arts has evolved so much over the time. I mean, even if we go to as recent as the 1900s, the 1800s, the warriors of that time, they're not beating any of these guys, let alone thinking about ancient history like Alexander the Great with Pancration and the Japanese learning jiu-jitsu and all that stuff. The ancient Greeks with their boxing like Malankamas winning the Olympics like 2,000 years ago. Or you look at guys like Yu Fei, who people regard as the greatest martial artist in Chinese history, who developed the martial art Yu Jian Quan, and it kind of looks like Tai Chi. So... Yeah, none of those guys are going to beat anybody today. They have the mentality to do so. They were very brutal and used to the violence that martial arts looked like back in the day. I mean, pain creation only had like three rules, right? Three forbidden techniques, like eye gouging, biting, and I think fish hooking. I'm pretty sure everything else was allowed. But definitely a lot of those guys like Musashi Miyamoto had a great mindset for martial arts. I believe unarmed combat. He didn't talk about it as much, but the philosophy from a guy like that, you would think would have a good mindset for even hand-to-hand -hand combat. Then we'll go to Cesar Martinez. How would a prime Tony Ferguson do 
against the seven men who defeated him in his downfall. So first man, Justin Gaethje. I think Justin would have beaten Tony Ferguson, but it would have been a lot closer. Charles Oliveira. I would pick Charles. I think he would have beaten Michael Chandler. I think he would have beaten Nate Diaz. Definitely beat Bobby Green. And he would have sent Patty Pimble back to Cage Warriors. Look at the Eric Cardenas. If you had to choose five UFC fighters from the past or present to defend you from 20 random guys at the bar, who are you choosing? So I would pick... Obviously, Francis Ngannou, he could probably take out like five by himself. Then you got Shane Carwin. Shane Carwin could take out another five. Sergei Pavlovich could take out another five. I got Derek Lewis. So that pretty much takes out the 20. Then we'll have GSP where we're sitting down just talking about aliens as that's going down. Then with the HMS Thunderchild. Top 10 pre-USADA fantasy matchups. Baral versus the top 10 bantamweights. He beats Jonathan Martinez. He beats Rob Font. Beats Davis and Figueredo. Beats Song Yadong. Beats Cheeto. Loses the Petrion, loses the Corey Sanhagen, beats Henry Cejudo, loses the Marab Davalashvili, beats Aljamain Sterling, and loses the Sean O'Malley. TRT Vitor versus the top 10 middleweights. He beats Roma Delize, loses the Hamza Shemaev, beats Nazardine Imovov, beats Brennan Allen, beats Paula Costa, beats Marvin Vittori. Ooh, Jared Kananir, that's a tough one. I think he might beat Jared Kananir, but I'm not too sure about that. Robert Whitaker. it depends how Whitaker approaches this. If he's all bouncy-bouncy karate style, I think Vitor's counter style could catch him, right? And one shot from TRT Vitor could put Robert Whitaker out. But if Whitaker approaches it with more grounded footwork and works off his boxing and wrestling, I think Whitaker should be able to win that. I think Israel Adesanya beats him. I think he beats Sean Strickland. And he has a chance against Drickus, but I might go with Drickus. Uberim versus the top 10 at heavyweight. And this is Uberim not messing around, not cocky. Right, because he got knocked out by Bigfoot and Travis Brown when he shouldn't have. When he got a bit cocky out there. So let's say he's fully focused and he's looking to just destroy these guys. He beats Derek Lewis. He beats Tai Tuivasa. He beats Sergei Spivak. He beats Jelton Almeida. There's no way Jelton takes him down. Alexander Volkov's a tough one, but I think he could take Volkov down from the clinch and submit him. He beats Curtis Blades. The current Stipe he beats. He beats Sergei Pavlovich again. He beats Cyril Gan. Tom Aspinall. I will go with Tom Aspinall, and then I'll also go with John Jones. But the John Jones fight is very, very difficult. I think Ubrin could definitely put up a good fight against Jones. And that is the end of the episode, guys. Great questions, and I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. And if you did, make sure to give this a like, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and I'll see you guys in the next video.